Having received the order to relocate, Major Resnick gathered the entire leadership of the regiment. He told in detail how the relocation should be carried out, who heads the flight echelon and what groups will be flying, who heads the ground echelon. Here was also determined the order of dispersal of aircraft on the landing airfield. Squadron commanders, Major Trilovich, Captain Ovcharov and Senior Lieutenant Timofeev, immediately began preparing their squadrons for the flight. Engineering staff prepared MIGI, carefully inspected technicians, mechanics, motorists material part, diligently worked gunsmiths. Everyone understood that we fly to the front and meeting with the air enemy could happen at any minute. Therefore, combat vehicles thoroughly prepared for a fight with the enemy. The pilots did not waste time. Each of us clarified his place in the group during the flight. We analysed in detail and possible landing options. And if we meet the enemy in the air, how to act then? Ask a junior lieutenant Bereznoy. The task remains the same. Flight, replied squadron commander Major Trilovich. To engage in combat, if in the air attacked the enemy. And immediately explained in detail how to act in this case. The regiment command was deeply thought out all the elements, all stages of a responsible flight provided for every possibility and did everything to ensure full freedom of action of our aircraft on the route and for the safety of landing at the new airfield. It was decided to build squadrons in two echelons. In front, the strike group, behind it, the cover group. In the strike group, two links in the cover group, one. In turn, each group is echeloned by height, following in visual visibility. On approach to the landing airfield, each wing of the squadron must take a certain altitude. The first link, at an altitude of 200 metres, the other links echeloned at an altitude above the airfield. After listening to detailed explanations of the squadron commander, the pilots leaned over the maps. We studied the flight route, determined the total distance, the distance between control landmarks. All data were plotted on the map and recorded in the logbook. Soon the squadron commanders reported to Major Resnick about the readiness of personnel for the flight. The regiment commander passed the appropriate report to the higher headquarters, and soon from there came the order to begin relocation. By the end of the day, the regiment was at the new airfield. For a pilot, an airfield is the same as a firing position for an artilleryman. From the choice of its location, from camouflage to a large extent, depends on the success of combat operations. In Baranovici, we have already seen by bitter experience that an open airfield puts the equipment under attack at the time when it can be most easily destroyed. The new airfield was empty at the moment of our landing. We could not ask the pilots who were here before us about its peculiarities, about the surrounding terrain. Craters from aviation bombs within the boundaries of the airfield showed that the Germans knew the airfield. This put us in a disadvantageous position. The fascists undoubtedly have already studied everything around and we do not know anything yet. We examined the airfield which occupied a flat area of about 800 sound 1200 meters. A pine forest rose to the northeast of the airfield. In the southwest there was a swamp. This required special care in calculating the landing. However, the fact that the forest and shrubbery came close to the airfield and in some places even wedged into it, created favourable conditions for camouflage. Remembering the sad experience of Baranovici, we dispersed the planes and camouflaged them. Just before sunset, at an altitude of about 3,000 metres, two fascist fighters, Mi-109, flew by. They flashed in the sky and disappeared in the western direction. Now wait for guests, someone said. To assume that the Germans had not detected us was, of course, ridiculous. And yet that day passed quietly for us. Apparently, quickly thickening dusk made a raid on the airfield impossible. Since the relocation was carried out in a very short time, the engineering staff at the airfield has not yet arrived. In our squadron, for example, for all aircraft had only one aviation specialist. Military technician second rank, Vanin. However, this did not embarrass anyone. Pilots, even in peacetime, practically practiced the preparation of aircraft for flight. 
and in Kursk strengthened the skills learned. And so now, when circumstances deprived us of our faithful assistance, the pilots themselves began to perform the duties of technicians, motorists and gunners. Let's see what you have done here, said Vanin, approaching the aircraft. He pointed out some defects and helped to eliminate them. Having checked several airplanes, he said, Here's what, friends. In combat conditions, you cannot always rely on the help of technicians. It is necessary to master independently refueling of airplanes with fuel, oil, ammunition, and you, as I see, you still have little practice. By the end of the day, everyone is thoroughly tired. It's a joke to say, in less than a day, to be in the roles of pilots, navigators and mechanics. It seemed that you could only get to bed, fall down and fall asleep, and tomorrow, into battle. And this thought excited me, kept me awake. Onishchenko and Sibirin settled down next to me. Our beds were close together and even a quiet whisper was perfectly audible. But everyone was whispering and it seemed as if a swarm of bees were buzzing. More than once or twice a voice came from one corner or the other. Enough, guys, let's go to sleep. We have to get up at dawn tomorrow. For a minute, everything was silent. And then the conversations began again. Leaders and wingmen again and again clarified their functions, discussed possible variants of meeting with the enemy. And how many such options? Thousands, and therefore there were more and more new questions. Did not sleep and in the room where the command of the regiment. Muffled whispering came from there. We fell asleep late. And a little light, all were already at the airfield. One link took the readiness number one, and all the other pilots gathered around the divisional commander, hero of the Soviet Union, Major General of Aviation Klevtsov, who had arrived at our airfield. How is the mood? asked the general. Excellent, answered for all of us the regiment commander, and we were in complete agreement with him. That's good, said the division commander. Morale is a big thing. Sit down, comrades, and let's talk on the merits. We settled right on the ground at the edge of the forest. Klevtsov took out of the tablet map and began to bring us up to speed. First of all, the division commander informed about the situation at the front. Our ground troops are fighting hard. The enemy, not counting losses, rushes forward. Against the troops of the Bryansk front is coming army group of General Guderian, the main backbone of which are tanks and mechanised divisions. Shortly before our arrival at the front, this group was replenished with two army corps, the 7th and 20th. Literally on the eve of our relocation, Hitlerites managed to occupy Unesha. On August 18th, the German troops continued to develop their offensive. Tank units of the enemy occupied the town of Starodub. Having taken Unesha, continued the division commander, the enemy is trying to develop the attack in two directions, on Novgorod Seversky and on Pochep. Especially hard fighting is going on now in the area of Pochep. The pilots looked at each other. Even a quick glance at the map showed that from Pochep to our airfield in a straight line, about 100 to 120 kilometres, and it means that we got to the direction of the main blow and that hot fights are to come. Talking about the situation at the front, General Klevtsov especially dwelled on the situation in the air. As we learned, the enemy fighter aviation operated in groups of two to four airplanes. These groups were moving in an elongated bearing. Nazi fighters entered the battle only under favourable conditions for them. They did not like to take risks, and if they did not have numerical superiority, did not have advantages in height and speed, could not achieve tactical surprise, they did not enter the battle. Bomber aviation operated in groups of three to twelve aircraft. Each of these groups had direct cover from six to twelve fighters, in addition, forward, at a distance of ten, twelve kilometres, sent a group of up to six aircraft, Mi-109. Forward cover group, as experience has shown, sought to shackle our fighters. This information was somewhat unexpected for us. From descriptions of battles in Western Europe, we knew that the German bombers very often went to perform tasks without any cover. Here it was different. 
Apparently, having met the active resistance of Soviet pilots, the enemy was forced to organise a cover for the bomber aviation. Only in difficult weather conditions, General Klevtsov noted, German bombers operate without cover, using cloud cover. They strike our troops' combat orders and places of concentration, railroad junctions and crossings. Strikes on airfields are carried out mainly by fighters. German aviation is based on airfields near Mogilev, Gomel, Krychev. Your task, to reliably cover the troops on the battlefield and in places of concentration from enemy airstrikes, escort bombers and attack aircraft, reconnaissance and strike at enemy airfields and his troops on the march. 6. This was the programme of our combat operations, and we immediately began to implement it. Here's what, friends. In combat conditions, you cannot always rely on the help of technicians. It is necessary to master independently refuelling of airplanes with fuel, oil, ammunition, and you, as I see, you still have little practice. By the end of the day, everyone is thoroughly tired. It's a joke to say, in less than a day, to be in the roles of pilots, navigators and mechanics, it seemed that you could only get to bed, fall down and fall asleep, and tomorrow, into battle. And this thought excited me, kept me awake. Onishchenko and Sibirin settled down next to me. Our beds were close together, and even a quiet whisper was perfectly audible. But everyone was whispering, and it seemed as if a swarm of bees were buzzing. More than once or twice a voice came from one corner or the other. Enough, guys, let's go to sleep. We have to get up at dawn tomorrow. For a minute everything was silent. And then the conversations began again. Leaders and wingmen again and again clarified their functions, discussed possible variants of meeting with the enemy. And how many such options, thousands, and therefore there were more and more new questions. Did not sleep and in the room where the command of the regiment. Muffled whispering came from there. We fell asleep late, and a little light all were already at the airfield. One link took the readiness number one, and all the other pilots gathered around the divisional commander, hero of the Soviet Union, Major General of Aviation Klevtsov, who had arrived at our airfield. How is the mood? asked the general. Excellent, answered for all of us, the regiment commander, and we were in complete agreement with him. That's good, said the division commander. Morale is a big thing. Sit down, comrades, and let's talk on the merits. We settled right on the ground at the edge of the forest. Klevtsov took out of the tablet map and began to bring us up to speed. First of all, the division commander informed about the situation at the front. Our ground troops are fighting hard. The enemy, not counting losses, rushes forward. Against the troops of the Bryansk front is coming army group of General Guderian, the main backbone of which are tanks and mechanised divisions. Shortly before our arrival at the front, this group was replenished with two army corps, the 7th and 20th. Literally on the eve of our relocation, Hitlerites managed to occupy Unesha. On August 18th, the German troops continued to develop their offensive. Tank units of the enemy occupied the town of Starodub. Having taken Unesha, continued the division commander. The enemy is trying to develop the attack in two directions, on novgorod Seversky and on Pochep. Especially hard fighting is going on now in the area of Pochep. The pilots looked at each other. Even a quick glance at the map showed that from Pochep to our airfield in a straight line, about 100, 120 kilometres. And it means that we got to the direction of the main blow and that hot fights are to come. Talking about the situation at the front, General Klevtsov especially dwelled on the situation in the air. As we learned, the enemy fighter aviation operated in groups of two to four airplanes. These groups were moving in an elongated bearing. Nazi fighters entered the battle only under favourable conditions for them. They did not like to take risks, and if they did not have numerical superiority, did not have advantages in height and speed could not achieve tactical surprise. They did not enter the battle. Bomber aviation operated in groups of three to twelve aircraft. 
Each of these groups had direct cover from six to twelve fighters, in Adition, forward at a distance of 10-12 kilometers, sent a group of up to six aircraft Mi-109. Forward cover group, as experience has shown, sought to shackle our fighters. This information was somewhat unexpected for us. From descriptions of battles in Western Europe, we knew that the German bombers very often went to perform tasks without any cover. Here it was different. Apparently, having met the active resistance of Soviet pilots, the enemy was forced to organize a cover for the bomber aviation. Only in difficult weather conditions, General Klevtsov noted, German bombers operate without cover using cloud cover. They strike our troops' combat orders and places of concentration, railroad junctions and crossings. Strikes on airfields are carried out mainly by fighters. German aviation is based on airfields near Mogilev, Gomel, Krychev. Your task, to reliably cover the troops on the battlefield and in places of concentration from enemy airstrikes, escort bombers and attack aircraft, reconnaissance and strike at enemy airfields and his troops on the march. 56. This was the programme of our combat operations, and we immediately began to implement it. On the first day had to face a difficult meteorological situation, at an altitude of 400 to 500 metres overhanging dense clouds. However, it was a little consoling that the horizontal visibility was excellent. The pilots, sitting in the airplanes in readiness number one, were waiting for departure. As we guessed, Yesterday's German scouts had discovered us, but since the dusk did not give the opportunity to immediately strike the airfield, in the morning, an hour and a half to two hours after dawn, enemy planes appeared above us. General Klevtsov was still at the airfield when the phone rang at the command post of the regiment. I'm listening, picked up the phone Major Resnick. Intermittent voice said, over the front line with a course of 70 de Gras past 8 Mi 109 at low altitude. The regiment commander reported the message to the commander. Act, General Klevtsov ordered. A rocket flew into the sky. The fighter squadron took to the air. Soon it was joined by a second. Those who remained at the airfield saw how at a distance of about five kilometres from our airfield, strictly to the east, passed on a shaving flight of eight German fighters. It was clear that the Nazis were cunning. Very demonstratively, they did not pay attention to our airfield, obviously trying to create the impression that they were not interested in it at all. However, even if it was indeed so, should have taken measures to repel a possible attack. And the pilots who were in the air, the radio was transmitted about the appearance of German fighters in the area of the airfield. Not a few minutes later, as from the east, from behind the clouds, came out of the eight messes and flew down in the direction of the airfield. The enemy strike did not reach the target, neither the personnel nor the material part was not damaged. German pilots tried to repeat the attack, but were themselves attacked by our fighters. At the same time, 57 began to fire anti-aircraft artillery. The Nazis hurried to get away. General Klevtsov, Carefully observed the air situation, emphasised that patrolling fighters should have made an attack, but it did not happen because of the incorrect construction of the combat order and poor discretion of pilots. We should pay special attention to these issues. We understood it perfectly well ourselves, and the comment of the division commander caused a blush of shame on our faces. By ten o'clock in the morning, visibility began to improve. For the rest of the day, only some white clouds occasionally passed over us. During August 19th, each pilot made from four to six, and some even eight combat sorties. Only physically hardened people could withstand such a load. Sport, our faithful assistant in peaceful studies, turned out to be even more necessary and important in the front situation. And we, being at the front, more than once remembered with gratitude our commanders, who instilled in us good physical endurance. Of course, to go into battle six to eight or even ten times in a row, one needs the greatest not only physical but also moral hardening, holy faith in the rightness of the cause for which one fights, boundless love for one's people, loyalty to the motherland, the party, 
hatred of its enemies. Hitler's invaders did not and could not have all this. These noble feelings tirelessly supported us in a difficult moment, inspired us, helped us in battle. All pilots went up in the air as many times as it was necessary. We often even took food without getting out of the cockpit. Sometimes our noses bled from overexertion. Recently I had to meet Colonel Vanin. Remembering the past, we talked a lot about our experiences in the harsh 1941, about our combat friends. Vanin reminded me, for example, how tirelessly Junior Lieutenant Sibirin was rushing into battle. It seemed that there was no more strength, but he again and again rose into the sky and went to the enemy. August 19th, in the list of the regiment, did not have to enter any 5018 one shot down Nazi aircraft. Several times we tried to engage, but the German pilots evaded direct confrontations. Obviously, the Nazis, deceived by Goebbelsovskoy propaganda, Rastrublirovania about the destruction of Soviet aviation, were stunned by the appearance of our aircraft, and even such as MiG-3. In the neighbourhood of our airfield was located a regiment of attack aircraft, commanded by Major Lozheshnikov. From the very first day, we interacted with this regiment, covering its combat operations. The situation at the front was extremely difficult. The enemy concentrated forces for further offensive. There were plenty of objects for bombing and assault, and not only on the battlefield, but also on the march. The only trouble is that we still had little aviation. Therefore, it was used mainly in the most important areas. During a reconnaissance flight, Sasha Onishchenko and Roshkov in the area of Roslavl found tanks and motorised infantry moving towards the front. The command gave the order to Lozhechnikov's air assault regiment to make an assault on the enemy column, and our regiment, continuing to cover the ground troops on the battlefield, to cover the attack aircraft. This was our first escort of attack aircraft. At the same time, Ili were the only means in the hands of the command to ensure combat operations of ground troops and the destruction of enemy reserves. For each shot down, attack aircraft fighter pilots who covered the combat operations of attack aircraft were personally responsible. Setting the task, Major Resnick dwelled on the peculiarities of escorting Ilov and the importance of the task. Everything was theoretically clear, but how it would turn out in practice, it is unknown. At the appointed time, on command from the control room rose two units of attack aircraft and one unit of fighters. Forces to cover was, of course, not enough, but we took into account that over the battlefield were our fighters, which can support in case of need. The height of flight is about 20-50 metres. At times, the attack aircraft were lowered to the ground and it was almost impossible to see them. The fighters went a little higher than the attack aircraft in order to provide a manoeuvre when meeting with enemy fighters. The first group, led by the regiment commander Major Lozheshnikov, and a group of fighter cover led by Captain Ovcharov, flying over the front line at extremely low altitude and maximum speed, came to the area of the moving enemy column. From guns, machine guns and rockets, fearless pilots attack aircraft destroyed tanks and other enemy combat vehicles. The first run was a strike on the head vehicles of the column with rockets, and then combined strikes with rockets and machine gun fire. No enemy fighters appeared over the battlefield, so our fighters, covering the ILOVs, simultaneously attacked the enemy's anti-aircraft machine gun firing points. The ILIS assault was successful. Tanks, cars, gasoline refuelers were burning. The first group of planes was followed by the second, third and fourth. Thus, the attack pilots inflicted significant damage to the enemy. Further movement of the column was suspended for a long time. The enemy suffered heavy losses in military equipment and people. The second sortie was unsuccessful. The fascist command threw a group of Messerschmitts against us. As a result, on the return route, MiG-3, piloted by pilot Rozhkov, and two ill were damaged and landed before reaching the airfield. Junior Lieutenant Rozhkov landed in a field in the burning airplane. He received minor burns and in a few days again took his place in the ranks. The main reasons for our failure were inconsistency in actions, poor fire interaction, lack of experience. 
Regimental Command carefully analysed the results of the day and took measures to eliminate errors and shortcomings. Of great importance for further joint combat operations was the meeting of the flying staff of both regiments. The first meeting of brothers in arms took place at our airfield on one of the non-flying overcast days. It was raining. Low over the ground were grey clouds driven by the wind. The mood was also under the colour of the clouds. It was very hard to sit on a hangar, knowing that you were needed on the front line. Two trucks slowed down on the platform in front of the control centre, and young but already war-scarred air fighters began to jump out of them. After friendly handshakes, everyone settled in the tent. Now there will be a funny conversation, one of ours remarked. It's a little late, of course, objected a tall pilot. We should have had a heart-to-heart -heart talk before the first joint flight. It's a pity that we suffer losses because of our lack of organisation. Yes, that's true. So let's discuss, analyse our mistakes in order to beat the enemy as successfully as possible and suffer fewer losses due to lack of coordination. Before the arrival of the regimental commander's heated dispute about swarming orders of attack aircraft on the route in the target area and over the target, the organisation of the fight with enemy fighters, on all these issues harshly criticised each other. With such a stretched combat order of attack aircraft, we cannot cover every plane, said the fighter pilots. And you, brothers, better watch the air, and when there are no enemy fighters, suppress anti-aircraft artillery fire on the battlefield, objected attack pilots. We need to think about the interaction directly within groups and between groups, then it will be good, said Ovcharov. Indeed, the essence of the matter came down to the lack of interaction and the need to comprehensively think through its forms. When the messes, instead of strictly maintaining a dense combat order that provides fire interaction, you do not withstand it. Individual attack aircraft lag behind, and messes hit them one by one. We, fighters, it is impossible for us to cover every plane, said Major Sidorov. You better watch yourself, was heard in reply. Does it rarely happen? We storm off, come out of the attack, and the fighter pilots have already disappeared and your trace is gone, then you do not have enough fuel or anti-aircraft artillery fire cannot withstand. And you don't leave the battle alone. We have to puzzle over how to provide your cover, not to accompany the departing airplane or to wait for the last ones to come out of the attack. But in both cases, the danger of being shot down increases for you and for us, entered the conversation squadron commander Major Trilovich. In the heat of the debate, no one noticed how Reznik, Lozheknikov, Shabanov entered the tent. Major Sidorov reported to the regiment commander. Comrade Major, the flight crew of the attack and fighter aviation regiments gathered to conduct a review of combat operations. Major Reznik said, We purposely did not enter you so that you here could talk heart to heart about our common cause and express to each other useful advice and fair claims. After this introduction, Major Lozheknikov spoke in detail about tactics, about the peculiarities of combat operations and combat orders of attack aircraft, about the principle of interaction of the attack group and attack aircraft with fighters. We have gathered today not to blame for each other's mistakes. It will do no good, and the cause will suffer. Who needs unnecessary casualties? The root of the evil lies in the ignorance of the peculiarities of combat operations by you and us. Then our regimental commander made a speech. So we found out all the burning questions and, as they say, put everything on the shelves. There was also a wish that the same fighter pilots would fly to cover the attack aircrafts. Detailed discussion of our common affairs was very useful for further joint actions. Having had lunch together, having treated our brothers-in-arms with the prescribed hundred grams, we escorted them to our airfield. After that, we began to act in a more coordinated and friendly manner. In early September, the regiment commander Major Lozeshnikov was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Many pilots of both regiments were awarded orders. We celebrated this event together. On the front in the areas of Kletny, Zhukovka, Trubchevsk and Starodub, fierce battles were fought. 
the enemy aviation increased its activity on the battlefield. The Soviet troops courageously repelled the enemy attacks. Our regiment, in addition to the permanent task to provide combat operations of the Attack Aviation Regiment and conduct aerial reconnaissance, was also assigned the task to reliably cover the ground troops on the battlefield from enemy airstrikes. This required serious extra effort from each pilot, but we ourselves were looking for opportunities to help the ground troops even more effectively. And found. Covering them from the attack of enemy aircraft, we began to take bombs which were dropped on enemy positions, most often in the location of artillery batteries. And this was already a real help to our heroic infantrymen. In addition, if there were no air battles during the cover of ground troops, then before returning to their airfield under the curtain, attacked fire points, vehicles and enemy manpower. And only with a minimum amount of ammunition, in case of a meeting with the air enemy, we returned to our airfield. So in continuous sorties past day after day, our remarkable engineers and technicians, junior aviation specialists, worked almost without rest, ensuring trouble-free operation of combat aircraft. Gunners, tirelessly preparing weapons. They worked day and night to provide each airplane with ammunition for at least seven or eight sorties a day. The most time-consuming was the stuffing of ammunition belts, and in addition, it was necessary to prepare bombs to check the state of armament on each aircraft. A pilot would return from a combat mission and his first word to his combat friend's technicians about how the weapon worked. And if it failed for any reason, it was considered an emergency. Every hour, every minute of our daily routine was filled with anxiety, danger. But we were so involved in combat life that we didn't think about it. Outwardly, everything looked monotonous. A sortie, reconnaissance, assault, air combat. But any sortie in a combat situation is never like the previous ones. Here to act according to the learned rules, according to the template is impossible. For example, say on August 19th, Sasha Onishchenko and I flew on reconnaissance in the area of Krichev and without much difficulty having completed the task, very soon returned and the next day in the same area we met a powerful anti-aircraft fire of the enemy. Naturally, both tactics and time spent on the task changed dramatically. We had to do a lot of manoeuvring to get away from the bursts of anti-aircraft shells. The day of August 21st, 1941 was exceptionally hard. Hitlerites, having concentrated on one of the sections of the Bryansk front, up to 300 tanks and a lot of motorised infantry, attacked and captured Pochep. The enemy tried to develop success in other directions. Our ground troops heroically fought for every inch of the native land. The fascists suffered heavy losses in manpower and equipment, but the superiority of the enemy in tanks and motorized infantry tipped the scalies to his side. We, pilots, helped glorious infantrymen, tankers, cavalrymen by all means, but we still had few airplanes. In addition, in heavy air battles and from the fire of the enemy's ground air defence, we were losing battle friends and equipment. The only means to somehow compensate for the lack of airplanes was to increase the number of combat sorties. The pilots of our squadron on August 21st made seven to nine sorties each, escorting attack aircrafts, which crushed enemy tanks in the area of Pochep, conducted reconnaissance, stormed airfields in the area of Seshcha, Krichev, covered ground troops. The evening of this difficult day was approaching. Our squadron from the morning relocated from the airfield of Karachev to the airfield of Bryansk. There were two pairs in readiness number one, Junior Lieutenant Rozhkov with Junior Lieutenant Ivanov and me with Junior Lieutenant Sibirin. The time of stay in readiness number one was then defined as two hours. If no sorties were made during this period, the pilots in readiness number one got out of their airplanes and had a chance to rest, however, without going far away from their machines, which were standing in the Caponniers. We had already made for the day eight combat sorties. Suddenly, a green rocket flies up from the control centre. My technician shouts, Take off! I give the command, Launch! He immediately opens the valve of the compressed air cylinder. The mechanic removes the camouflage, 
the engine on the airplane is started. We turn out of the Caponia and take off. On the radio we receive an order, where to go. We answer, 0304, understood you. Course 200 degree, two U88s. Height about 3,000 meters. Distance 80, gaining altitude on afterburner. I felt tired because it was our ninth sortie for today. Flying out again on a combat mission, we were sure that now we could not do without a fight. Our premonition did not deceive us. Not even 15 minutes later, as the commander's voice sounded in the headphones, two U-88s are heading 90 degree in the direction of point C. Having received the message, we began to watch the air even more closely, and soon Sibirin transmitted by radio. I see two U T O's on the right above. Heavily loaded with bombs fastiest planes went straight to the railroad bridge. The bridge was one of the main targets for fascist aviation, as it was the only railroad line connecting the rear with the front troops. We are going at maximum speed, simultaneously gaining altitude. One thought owns us, not to let the enemy to drop bombs on the railroad bridge to destroy the enemy bombers. However, the surprise attack failed as the crews of Junkers noticed us. I'm transmitting on the radio to Sibirin. Hero 4, hit the wingman. O3 understood. We put our long-nosed hawks into dive. From the first attack, we managed to hit one U88. It went up in smoke and began to go down. At this point, it was not difficult for us to finish it, but the second bomber, gaining altitude, stubbornly continued to fly to the target. I'm transmitting, 04, pursue the bomber. I went up. I made such a decision because there were no enemy fighters. Maybe it wasn't the best decision. When I caught up with the U-88, I saw a yellow cross sprawled on the fuselage and immediately opened fire. The air gunner began to shoot back furiously. I manoeuvred, dodging the fire, and at the same time gained altitude for an attack from above, from behind. Again aimed fire then, manoeuvre and again to attack. I see my shells explode on the planes of the fascist, in the area of the engine, and from under the hoods show slanting tongues of flame licking the plane. At the same time I notice that the planes of my plane are pierced by enemy bullets. However, continuing to fight, I send another line. And here between the engine and the fuselage of the enemy bomber appears a thin white strip. It flows gasoline, and then junkers, all engulfed in flames, goes to the ground. Seeing with my eyes blazing junkers, I suddenly found that near my plane burst anti-aircraft shells. The airplane shudders, the characteristic sound of the engine is silenced, the propeller is idling. I quickly turn my eyes to the altimeter, the height of 2,500 meters. Immediately I make a 180 degree turn, the ground is rushing towards me. I barely had time to choose a site, release the landing gear and land on a ploughed field. I jumped out of the cockpit with a gun in my hand and looked around. Where am I? On my own or on enemy territory? If I'm in enemy territory, I have to set the plane on fire. At that time, I see a boy of about 12 years old running towards me, shouting from afar. Ours, ours! I hurry to ask him whether we are here or not. For some reason, the boy is in no hurry to answer. He stops a few steps away and scrutinises my fighter and me. I can't figure out what's going on. At the same time, voices are heard behind me. I turn around and see people running towards me. They are shouting something in Russian. So they are my own. It's interesting how man works. Often he realises the danger that threatened him only after the danger has passed. And then he reacts, his knees tremble and a cold sweat breaks out. Something like that happened to me. I was so excited that I was not immediately able to explain who I was and where I had come from. When I finally came to my senses and told that I had just shot down a German airplane and was hit by anti-aircraft fire, the collective farmers almost strangled me in their arms. Are you wounded? A young woman asked me solicitously. What kind of help do you need? At this difficult moment I felt the care and attention of our Soviet people. 
the warmth coming from the heart. On their own initiative, they organized the security of the plane. Since I firmly declared that I would not leave the airplane, they brought me milk, eggs, bread from the village. I had dinner and then had a good sleep in a haystack that was almost next to me. Even at daylight, I tried to contact the command of the regiment and report my whereabouts and the damage to the airplane. It took about two hours, but in the end, the connection was established. My comrades were terribly worried about me and now breathed a sigh of relief. Sibirin, my battle friend, a young pilot, less than a year served in our regiment, also finished the enemy plane and safely returned to his airfield. Having dealt with the junkers, he asked on the radio where I was. Meanwhile, I was finishing the massacre of the Ju-88 and was already shot down. Neither he nor the airfield heard my transmission about the results of the battle because of strong interference. We accomplished the task. The bridge was as indestructible as a cliff. After landing, my technician Kalamuzin asked Sibirin, Where is the commander? Sibirin told him and Major Sidorov what he knew, but where I was and what was wrong with me, he did not know. The next day, early in the morning, from the regiment arrived flyer. They replaced the fuel tank on my MiG and straightened the propeller blades. Thanking the collective farmers for their attention and care, I flew to my airfield. Getting out of the airplane, I approached Major Sidorov. Comrade Major, the mission is completed. I know, I know, he interrupted me. The ground troops have already reported everything. Well done, you and Sibirin. Immediately I found myself in the arms of my friends. Everyone congratulated Sibirin and me on the victory. I reported in detail to Sidorov how I had conducted the air battle, and then the discussion began. The first and most important conclusion was that we and Sibirin allowed unjustified risk, destroyed enemy bombers each independently. Indeed, if at this point appeared at least a couple of Messerschmitts, we would have been shot down. We also did not achieve surprise attack, and although the task was accomplished, our planes were damaged. Quite differently developed events in the air battle, which happened to participate in a few days later, our pilots. They were three, junior lieutenants, Shkatov, Rozhkov, and, at the head of the link, Berezhnoi. They were tasked to cover the troops on the battlefield in the area of Zhukovka, Kletny. Not far from the front line, Shkatov radioed that he saw four Messerschmitt 110. Almost immediately saw them Rozhkov and Berezhnoi. Four Messers were heading towards Bryansk. Our link made a U-turn towards them. With numerical superiority, the Germans usually imposed the battle themselves. However, in this case, the brave actions of our fighters stunned the enemy. Messers quickly turned toward the front, and in a column one after another began to leave. The initiative was on the side of our pilots, and this is already a lot. When the enemy retreats, if even the arithmetic ratio of forces in his favour, the advantage on the side of the pursuer. And the pilots did not hesitate to use this opportunity. At the moment of the enemy's turn, our fighters had the opportunity to immediately attack. I'll attack the leader said Berezhnoi, and you destroy the trailing. Berezhnoi increases speed, converges, and from behind attacked the front going Mi-110. Conducts aimed fire from an extremely short distance. Messer flares up, turns over and goes to the ground. One of the three German planes following the leading Mi-110 opened fire on Berezhnoi's plane. Enemy shells sink into the planes of his plane. Berezhnoi manoeuvres to get out from under the blow. At this time, Shkatov transmits on the radio. There are five, immediately sharply up, behind the messer at a minimum distance, pursuing him. Shkatov, pursuing the messer, which was shelling Berezhny's plane, shot it down at the moment when it sharply went up behind Berezhny. The crew of the Mi-110, attacked by Roskov, was taken by surprise. The German did not even have time to realise what was happening, as Roskov's fire hit him. Of the four Messers shot down three. And if with the numerical superiority of the enemy he did not dare to take the fight, it is not surprising that seeing the wreckage of three of his fighters burning on the ground, the crew of the fourth thought only about how to escape. The result of the battle our Falcons were satisfied. 
However, after their return, they, together with their comrades, had to subject their actions to serious critical analysis and admit that they had not fought in the best way. True, in the battle we acted boldly, decisively, showed a lot of will to win, but, as Berezhnoi said, we still lacked stamina and skill. And for himself he concluded that he got into a difficult situation solely through his own fault, and if the enemy crew had fired more accurately, it would have been for sure the last flight of Berezhny, the habit of not revelling in victorias, and soberly analyse the actions instilled in us in peaceful conditions, regimental commander Major Resnik. He did the same now, every evening summarising the past day, analysing in detail the most important moments of our combat practice. The accumulated combat experience pilots consolidated theoretically and practically. For all this, we were deeply grateful to their teachers. Our commanders tried in every possible way to cultivate in us restraint, composure, absolutely necessary for a fighter pilot. In battle, it is not easy to cope with your nerves. Having seen an enemy airplane, some pilots broke away from their groups and attacked it independently, not noticing that there were other enemy airplanes in the vicinity. The result of such individual actions was, as a rule, the death of both the airplane and the pilot. So died, for example, Junior Lieutenant Tiki. It was a young pilot. He came to the regiment in late 1940 after graduating from the school. Like all of us, Tiki was an eyewitness to the shooting of children and women near Slutsk and burned with hatred for the despicable killers. But this noble aspiration had to be realised reasonably, and Tikai let his feelings override his reason. Here's how it happened. Six of our fighters under the command of Major Trilovica fought a group of enemy aircraft. The squadron commander was the first to attack. The rest of the pilots followed him. After the first attack, one of the German planes, engulfed in flames, crashed into the ground. Each fighter chose a target for himself and went into the attack. Our pilots acted courageously, carefully watched the situation, at any moment were ready to help each other. Suddenly, Junior Lieutenant Tiki separated from the group. He noticed an enemy plane in the side and, hoping for an easy success, without warning anyone, rushed into the attack. But as soon as he moved away from his group, he was immediately attacked by a Messerschmitt and shot down. It was a heavy loss for us. From this tragic case, we made a conclusion to act only in a friendly and coordinated manner, providing full mutual assistance, not to chase after single planes, to be able to restrain our ardour. We must destroy the air enemy mercilessly, but tactically competent, with the least losses on our part. The Germans also perfectly understood the power of interaction in aerial combat. Provoking us to single action, they even specially allocated airplanes that were to play the role of a kind of bait, Maybe someone will bite. But we, already learned by bitter experience, did not take these baits, and if we attacked such planes, then only under cover. Regiment Commissar Vasily Ivanovich Shabanov was always among pilots and technicians, both on the ground and in the air. He taught us not only to hate the enemy, but also skillfully destroy him. One of the best pilots of the regiment, he equally with everyone flew reconnaissance on patrols, escorted attack aircraft and participated in the assault. Shabanov deeply believed in people. He saw every young pilot as a comrade. Knowing all of us well our strengths and weaknesses, the Commissar believed that each of us is ready for a feat in the name of the motherland. Therefore he trusted us, and we responded to this trust with filial gratitude. To fly with Shabanov was considered a high honour, and we considered such a flight as a test of maturity, a test of the ability to act independently. Preparation of change, preparation of future commanders. That's what these combat inspections were all about. Perhaps most of the pilots of the regiment had a chance to fly with the Commissar to fulfil combat missions. If we add to this the huge training and individual political and educational work conducted by him, it will become clear that the Commissar really knew each pilot, knew not only by papers, but first of all by his deeds on the ground and in the air. And the check in the air, and even in battle. 
it is a special kind of check. If the wingman made a mistake, the commissar never raised his voice. His voice was soft and sing-songy, but it did not prevent him from being demanding and strict. It has long been known that shouting and demanding are not the same thing. Some commanders had nothing to yell at a subordinate, insult him. But this was not demanding, but a manifestation of weakness, inability to work with people. Such commanders usually had neither authority nor respect. We learned from our commissar not only flying skills, but also the ability to work with people. I had a chance to fly with Battalion Commissar Shabanov. The flight was successful in all respects. We met a couple of enemy fighters, and our MiGs rushed at them from above. In front went the commissar. I covered him. All my attention was focused on covering the commissar. Therefore, I did not see how Shabanov attacked Mi-109. But however, the result of this attack was impossible not to notice. The enemy fighter burst into flames and, engulfed in flames, went to the ground. 03, right. Mi-109, turn right and immediately left. The Commissar's success encouraged me. I'll shoot, I'll definitely shoot, I whispered to myself, chasing the German, who tried to attack Shabanov. But the enemy at this time threw his car to the side, came out from under the blow and went sharply down. When we landed at our airfield, I did not hide my admiration for the Commissar's skill. You filmed it well? Shabanov smiled. What to talk about it? Let's better analyse your actions. And the Commissar began to reproduce in detail the situation of a fleeting battle. I listened and amazed. Most of all, I wondered when Shabanov had time to notice everything. After all, he attacked the enemy, the first to enter the battle. It turns out that this did not prevent him to closely monitor the air situation and my actions. That you seek to destroy the enemy, said Shabanov, it's good. But you cannot, at the sight of the enemy, headlong rush into battle. The Germans' pilots also know how to fight, and rashly, as they say, they cannot take them. As always, the Commissar was surrounded on all sides by pilots who were free from sorties. He addressed not only to me, but also to everyone else. It was useful for everyone to listen. You guys are young, hot, but in battle you need to control your passions. When you see the enemy, do not rush to attack. Evaluate the situation comprehensively, figure out where you stand in relation to the enemy. It will take a few seconds but you will not act on chance and reasonably build a battle plan. The pilots listened attentively. Shabanov, squatting on the ground, taking a branch, began to draw on the ground various schemes of air combat. So, met the enemy, assess the situation. If you go above the enemy, he does not see you. Attack immediately. Never forget that surprise, height and speed, success in battle. In addition, you must take into account the strengths and weaknesses of the Messers, up to a height of 2,500 to 3,000 metres. They are superior to us on the turn and speed, and above our MiG, the master of the situation. Therefore the conclusion, pull Mi-109 at altitude, and immediately sketched another scheme in the sand, one of the options for fighting with a breakaway at an altitude below 3,000 metres. And if two MiG will meet, say, six or even more messes, how to be. This asks Dima Berezhnoi. Yesterday he argued with Shkatov and Verkozin, proving that it is still necessary to attack. They argued that it was stupid. I don't know if Shabanov got to that argument, but he didn't hurry with an answer, but asked Berezhny's opinion first. He spilled everything he thought. Any other opinions? Shabanov asked. There are said Shkatov, and stated his point of view. Battalion Commissar listened to him carefully, and then again on the sand drew a scheme. Here come two links of messes. And what kind? 109th or 110th? Shabanov raised his head and looked carefully at Verkozin, who asked the question. Then said, I don't care if it's the 110s, and our two MiGs fly above them and the enemy does not see them as the fighters are lost in the sunlight. How would you, Comrade Verkozin, act in such a case? 
I would attack. And you, comrade Shkatov? I'd attack too. You can't miss such an opportunity. Quite right. You can't miss such an opportunity. And you, comrade Bereznoy, do you agree with that? Yes, I told them. Wait a minute. So you're attacking. The lines marking the movement of MiGs on the diagram crossed a group of enemy fighters. In such an attack, said the battalion commissar, it is very important to clearly allocate responsibilities and do not hit the same plane. And then, look and decide. That's what you and the head is given. If the first attack was successful, provided speed and exit, attack again. If they accept the fight, go away. To fight two against four, a gamble. That's how it should always be decided. And if they fly bombers? Shabanov strictly looked at the questioner. Fighters have a special relationship with bombers. This is our main enemy. The sacred duty of a fighter, to destroy as many enemy bombers as possible. And here there can be only one solution. Going into battle, there is nothing to ask how many enemy bombers. And ask only one question. Where are they and where are you? Create or take such an initial position for the attack that you are in the best conditions. That's what you are, a fighter. These instructive talks of senior commanders and political workers in that hot time were one of the important operational and effective forms of party political work to educate pilots on the living examples of heroism, high combat skill and fidelity to military duty. For operational dissemination of combat experience, popularization of distinguished pilots and technicians, combat leaflets were widely used. They were issued every day, and they told who and in what today distinguished themselves. They were handwritten in pencil. Often the secretary of the party bureau, senior political officer Serduk, was in charge of issuing them. He was not a pilot, but his authority among the air fighters was extremely high. Serduk was able to find a common language with pilots, technicians, knew well the situation, the mood of people. Of course, when conditions allowed, held party and komsomol meetings. In the spring of 1961, Colonel Shabanov, reviewing his front records, read me the following passage. August 28, 1941. Since morning it is cloudy, it is raining lightly. The flight crew is in dugouts. Pilots on duty in the airplanes. A Komsomol meeting was held to discuss the Soviet government's note to Iran. The conversation turned to our affairs. The main idea is to beat the enemy even better. Indeed. Every day after the end of flights, all pilots gathered in the control room. Resnik or Shabanov analysed the results of the day, especially emphasised the analysis of combat operations, noted what was done well and what was bad. These conversations were brief but very informative. Then followed the traditional evening reading of the bulletin after which the task for the next day was determined. I would like to emphasise that our political work with people was very concrete and purposeful. Commissioner Shabanov, Secretary of the Party Bureau Serduk and other comrades used every opportunity for what was in those conditions the main thing the dissemination of experience of the distinguished, and this experience was accumulated by our pilots very quickly. In the course of battles formed, if this term is even admissible, more or less narrow specialization of pilots. Lieutenant Igor Voinov drew attention to himself with his high flying and navigational skills. We got acquainted with Voinov back in the 122nd Regiment, and after graduating from the courses of link commanders at the same time came to the 162nd Regiment, where he was appointed a link commander. Igor was a cheerful and sensitive man. Just before the war, he got married, but had no time to have children. However, Igor loved children very much, and together with Sasha Onishchenko was a great friend of kids. It was not worth it for Igor to start various games with them. He always had gifts in his pocket for them. Igor loved life, loved children, and when the war broke out in the name of our happy life, in the name of protecting Soviet people, bravely went into battle. There were very few pilots in the regiment who could compete with Voinov in the knowledge of navigating. It was our custom, 
If we were to fly an unknown route, the group was usually led by Voinov, and there was no case when Igor did not justify the commander's trust. There were very few pilots in the regiment who could compete with Voinov in the knowledge of navigating. It was our custom. If we were to fly an unknown route, the group was usually led by Voinov, and there was no case when Igor did not justify the commander's trust. When we arrived at the Bryansk front, excellent navigational training served Voinov as a basis for exemplary performance of air reconnaissance missions. And no one flew reconnaissance missions as successfully as Igor Voinov. Igor had an excellent wingman, Junior Lieutenant Verkozin, who arrived in our regiment from the school in December 1940. He stood out among his peers not only in his general development, but also in his knowledge of the special disciplines of aviation and combat aircraft. His business was going well, and Verkhozin was one of the first after the school was released in an independent flight on a new-for-him type of aircraft, I-16. He diligently mastered the technique of piloting, carefully listened to the advice and recommendations of senior commanders, was persistent, he took the example of young pilots. All of us had to work especially hard during the commissioning of young pilots. And here we, the commanders, did not pay enough attention to one of the most important elements of the flight, the flight in a circle, and especially the performance of landing. Once Verkozin allowed a significant overflight during the landing approach. The airplane rolled outside the rolled snowstrip of the airfield and received serious damage. I was temporarily acting as a squadron commander at that time, and the blame, admitted by the pilot, fell not only on the link commander, but also on me. I ran up to the airplane, which, having buried its wheels in the unrolled snow, stood on its nose. The propeller is bent, the lantern is broken. Verkozin, with a bloody face, is sitting in the cockpit, tied with shoulder straps, and trying to stop the blood from his broken nose with a handkerchief. When I saw that Verkozin was only slightly bruised, my heart was relieved. On that day, the deputy commander of the Air Force of the Western Special Military District, General Tayoski, was at the airfield. As soon as he became aware of what had happened, he immediately called the commander and the commissar of the regiment, Verkozin and me. Shortly before, this was issued a number of orders to combat accidents in aviation and those who allowed gross violations were strictly punished. Verkozen and I went to see the general. I realised that I was guilty. I overlooked, failed to timely notice the shortcomings in the training of pilots. We entered the office of the regiment commander. There's General Tayursky, Major Resnik, Shabanov. Birthday boys came, through the general when I reported on the arrival. I think he's joking, I thought. If so, maybe they won't kick them out but the further conversation made me wipe the cold sweat from my forehead more than once. Verkozin and I got a hard time. I even more. After all, I am the commander and responsible for my subordinates, for their actions, for discipline, even for their mood. On that memorable day, I felt especially keenly how difficult it is to be a commander, what a huge responsibility is imposed on him. The decision of the command was relatively mild. Verkozin went to the brig and I received five days of house arrest and a strict warning. At your leisure, think about the duties of a commander, advised General Tayoski. I answered cheerfully. There is to think about it. Such a relatively mild punishment was imposed, as General Tayoski said, taking into account our youth and inexperience. But we realised that we had to draw serious conclusions from this case for the rest of our lives. Verkozin continued to study with full effort and in the course of the war proved himself an excellent pilot. The pair Voinov, Verkozin with good reason, was considered one of the best in the regiment. The pilots acted bravely, decisively. More than once came out victorious from very heavy air battles. And air reconnaissance is not an easy business. Here you need a combination of high-flying and navigational skill and tactical training. Hitlerites were pulling up reserves for the next offensive. Our command was extremely necessary to know about all the movements of enemy troops. And it was possible to get this data only with the help of aerial reconnaissance. In addition, we were constantly monitoring the active airfields. 
we had another, no less important task, to identify new enemy airfields. We knew that the main enemy airfields were in the area of Roslavl, Krychev, but most enemy aircraft operated from field airfields, and it was not easy to detect them. And if our command still had the necessary data, then in this significant merit belongs to Igor Voinov and his battle friend Verkozin. Lieutenant Voinov and Junior Lieutenant Verkozin were the first to learn to detect the movement of enemy columns off the roads. They conducted reconnaissance at a gliding flight. This not only allowed them to see everything clearly, but also reduced the possibility of being hit by ground fire, especially anti-aircraft artillery. The enemy did not have time to prepare to fire, as our planes flashed over the column disappeared. On August 28th, our ground troops were ordered to repel enemy attacks in the area of Starodub, Pochep and counterattack. Feeling the pressure of the Soviet divisions, Hitlerites hastily began to transfer their tank and mechanized reserves to this area. Voinov and Verkozin, who flew out for reconnaissance, discovered the enemy's movement. The data was immediately transmitted to the headquarters of the Front Air Force. Very soon, our bombers and attack aircrafts flew out to bomb the Nazis. Since Voinov and Verkozin knew where the Nazi columns were moving, they were assigned to lead a group of cover bombers. In this flight, the crew of our bomber made an immortal feat. Voinov and Verkozin, witnesses of the feat, excitedly told his comrades about what happened. The bomber was hit by enemy anti-aircraft artillery fire. Sometime he was still in the air. Obviously, the crew consulted. And then the burning airplane decisively went into a dive straight at the column of enemy combat vehicles. The explosion that shook the air scattered the wreckage of the plane, along with this corsed great damage to the enemy. The decision to strike the enemy with his very death was made at the call of the heart of Soviet patriots who courageously fulfilled their duty to the motherland. The news about it flew lightning across all parts of the front. On the same day, Battalion Commissar Shabanov reported the names of fearless sons of the motherland. They were the aircraft commander Sergeant Skovorodin, pilot observer Lieutenant Vetlushsky, and gunner radiator junior Sergeant Cherkashin. Soon by the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, all of them were posthumously awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. The feat of Skovorodin, Vetlushsky and Cherkashin made a huge impression on everyone. The pilots admired the unparalleled courage of our glorious battle comrades. If to perish, they said, only so. In those days, everyone wanted to avenge for Skovorodinsky. The number of victories quickly grew. On August 28th, at about 15 o'clock at the command post of the regiment received a report. A single plane, Junkers 88, coming from the direction of Orel, shelling the highway on which our ground troops are moving. In the air at that moment were Voinov and Verhozin. They were ordered to destroy the Nazi bomber. The pilots found it in the area of Karachev. As soon as the Hitlerovite noticed our fighters, he, manoeuvring and clinging to the ground, began to leave towards the front. Voinov and Verhozin pursued the pirate, seeing by his skillful actions that this is an experienced and dangerous enemy. The bomber several times escaped from under the blow. However, in the area of Bryansk was shot down. Weeks passed in battles. Every day the ground and air situation on the Bryansk front changed it. Once a Kuznetsov and Roskov covered our troops over the front line near Jukovka. There were no enemy airplanes. On the ground, too, there was relative calm. Suddenly the fire of German artillery intensified. Positions of our troops were covered with pillars of ruptures. At the same moment, on the radio, pilots heard an order. Take off the adjuster. Henschel, south of Zhukovka, 10 kilometers. Henschel, 126. Neither Kuznetsov nor Roshkov had not had to meet with this aircraft before. But we knew that Henschel, a two-seat biplane with a speed of 200-250 kilometers per hour, very manoeuvrable in the horizontal plane. Having received the order, Kuznetsov and Rozhkov rushed to the specified area. It was necessary to act quickly, as combat duty in the air was coming to an end. They both knew that to detect the enemy aircraft is not so easy. 
Henschel operated usually at low altitude when observing from above merged with the terrain. However, our pilots detected the German adjuster. The crew of the Henschel noticed the Soviet planes and began to move away to the front line at an altitude of about 200 to 300 meters. He maneuvered, carefully camouflaged. But the enemy did not take into account one detail. The weather was sunny and his own shadow was creeping along the ground. Kuznetsov and Rozhkov went on the attack. Henschel made deep turns, went into a spiral. It was very difficult to aim fire at the wiggling plane at low altitude, but our pilots did not let the Nazi out. The shells dug into the enemy plane, and the cursed Etagereka, as it was called by the front-line soldiers, did not catch fire. Kuznetsov and Rozhkov attacked again and again. Henschel was spinning like a beast. His fuselage was punctured several times. According to all calculations, it should have long ago burned, but did not burn. And suddenly, Henschel went down sharply and landed on our territory. The pilots decided that they had managed to damage the engine of the enemy airplane. They looked at the ground. The crew of the Henschel jumped out of the plane and rushed to the forest. Having reported about it by radio, the pilots took a course to their airfield. But no sooner had they got out of the airplanes than we attacked them with reproaches. Oh, you, Morales, missed the Etagereka. Not at all, they objected. Henschel was hit, it landed in our territory. Here is the place. And Kuznetsov pointed on the map. The Germans circled you. As soon as you disappeared, they got into their plane and flew away. We've just been informed about it. Kuznetsov and Rozhkov laughed, and their friends laughed at them. And there's nothing to say, they missed it. I guess they didn't aim their fire well enough. But now we have experience. Next time we'll not deceive, fought back Rozhkov. However, they did not manage to meet the Etagerka again. But we all drew a conclusion from it. The enemy can be considered destroyed only when he is unable to resist. And for this purpose, it is necessary to constantly improve fire training in order to hit the enemy from the first attack. On the ground were fierce battles with the tank group Guderian. We had to fly both on reconnaissance and to attack, and to cover bombers and attack aircraft. And the number of airplanes was decreasing every day. Six to eight combat sorties a day became a common occurrence, especially often escorted illy. Attack aircraft proved themselves very well, and during the reflection of the strike of Guderian's tank group, they were no equal. On August 26th, the command post of the regiment received a message that ground reconnaissance in the area of Maglina detected the movement of a large mechanised column of the enemy. The front command ordered to immediately clarify this data. Two airplanes immediately took to the air. The pilots reported by radio, no columns in the area. Either our or ground scouts made a mistake, and yet it was urgent to find out who was right and determine the location of the enemy. We'll go Senior Lieutenant Ivanov, ordered Major Resnik. Ivanov familiarised himself with the flight route of the previous pair and outlined his own route. In the specified area he noticed the movement of enemy tanks, but to his surprise the tanks dispersed, turned into a field with bushes and disappeared. The pilot made a couple of circles, but the tanks were falling through the ground. The pilot realised that they must be here somewhere. Having descended, he passed at an extremely low altitude, and then a large number of haystacks caught his eye. They were not arranged in even rows, as usual, but as they were, and their size was much larger than normal haystacks. Everything became clear. Ivanov immediately radioed. In the place indicated to them were sent stormtroopers Major Lozeknikov. To cover them assigned six MiG, led by Senior Lieutenant Ivanov, for him was already prepared a spare airplane. Together with him flew Voinov, Zabavin, Sibirin, Ovcharov, Karpov. Fighters attached to the attack aircraft, escorting them like Cavaliers' girlfriends. Ivanov accurately led the group to the target. Ily went to Spears in the attack. On the ground appeared pockets of fire. Eilis replaced the bombers. 
As a result of these energetic actions, the enemy was greatly damaged. After this case, we began to more closely monitor the movement on the ground, and a day or two later, Voinov and Verkozin unraveled another similar trick of enemy tankers. Flying over a vast field, they discovered a suspicious cluster of people. What are they doing here? thought the pilots. Once again they flew over the field, as if nothing suspicious. People at the approach of airplanes lay on the ground, did not open fire. But in the field, as well as then, there are barns. We should check it out. The pilots made a second approach. The bombs suspended from the airplane flew on the barns. A heavy fire was opened from the ground, and only then the pilots realised that the enemy's tanks and vehicles were disguised under the bales. On the signal of the scouts there flew our attack aircraft and on the conscience worked the area. The Germans very widely used camouflage of their military equipment and troops in areas of concentration, but over time we learned to detect them almost without error. The pilots who flew out for reconnaissance carefully examined the favourite fascist troops' ravines, gardens and orchards. Often the enemy, having occupied the village, hid tanks in barns. We had to keep our eyes open. At the end of August the replenishment arrived to us. By the decision of the Stavka, the Bryansk Front was given the reserve air group of the main command. Four more Aviation regiments arrived at the front. Before their arrival on August 27, 1941, the Aviation units of the front made only 110 aircraft sorties. But on August 30 and 31, when the replenishment arrived and began combat operations, the number of aircraft sorties increased to 1,500. For two days, 52 enemy airplanes were shot down and destroyed. In the air, Hitlerites had more and more difficulties. Their losses grew. On September 1st, in the total number of victories included, and Mi-109, shot down by junior lieutenant Sero Glazovi and Mi during the cover of our troops. The offensive of the fascists on the ground was choked. And on September 2nd, the troops of the Bryansk Front began a general counter-attack. On the first day of the counter-attack, Voinov and his wingman Verkozin discovered the movement of motorised mechanised enemy troops from the area of Gomel in the direction of Novozibkov, Klintsi. On the road went more than 200 vehicles, cars, armoured cars, tanks. After Voinov to clarify the composition of the enemy, grouping was sent a pair of Ivanov. At eleven o'clock to meet the enemy, flew out a dozen attack aircraft from Major Lozeshnikov's regiment. Major Trilevich was assigned to cover them. As soon as the planes passed the front line, the attack aircraft split into two groups and went to the target from opposite directions. Fighters went with the group attacking from the north, which was to strike the first blow. Everything went exactly according to plan. The first group processed the head of the column. The fascist cars stopped. Hitlerites put into action anti-aircraft guns and were so engrossed in the reflection of the attack that they did not notice how the second group of Ilovs came from the south. The German anti-aircraft gunners were confused. They began firing indiscriminately in all directions and the effectiveness of their fire came to zero. Without losing a single airplane, the attackers set fire to 29 enemy vehicles and tanks. But this was not the end of the matter. Front Air Force Command sent here a group of bombers. As the pilots of our regiment who accompanied the bombers told later, five waves of bombs were dropped on the heads of fascists. The enemy column was thoroughly battered. The battle on the ground took an increasingly sharp character. Our pilots considered it a great honour to cover their ground troops. During the counter-attack of our troops, a 162nd Fighter Aviation Regiment very clearly performed this task. Gradually we developed our own tactics. Covering ground troops, we were not over our troops, but over the enemy. This was done for two reasons. Firstly, we deprived Hitlerites of the possibility, leaving us, to drop a bomb load on the positions of our troops. Secondly, if the enemy aviation on the battlefield was absent or was expelled, before the end of patrolling we made assault attacks on the enemy ground troops, trying to hit his artillery and mortar batteries, which were clearly visible from the air. 
We left only a dozen and a half rounds of ammunition for the return trip. Aerial bombs were dropped on enemy positions as soon as we arrived in the patrol area. Then they started to fulfil the main task, to cover their troops. Having made sure that the shift was coming, we dive-bombed the enemy positions and then at low altitude went to our airfield. Autumn came into its own. The weather has sharply deteriorated. Since September 10th, it rained continuously. German fascist troops on the Bryansk front were pulling up reserves. The situation at the front was heating up every day. The enemy persistently rushed forward. It was hard on the soul, but the faith in our victory was unshakable and increased our strength. The enemy was stopped in the area of Yatsevo. The troops of the Bryansk front, as a result of counterattack, not only stopped the enemy, but also squeezed out some of his divisions. Yes, at the beginning of September, we thought that the Nazi offensive was over. But a little time passed and it became clear. We, young lieutenants, were hasty in our conclusions. But though it was hard, all of us were burning desire to beat the enemy resolutely went into battle. Each day brought new examples of military valour, courage and fearlessness. Confidence in the victory of our just cause was growing, and it helped in battle. On September 12th, during the assault on the enemy airfield was hit by anti-aircraft artillery fire Boris Kuznetsov's plane. The airplane caught fire. Boris crossed the front line and immediately landed on the burning airplane. The pilot received severe burns and was evacuated to a rear hospital. His further fate is unknown to me. He was a fearless fighter and a wonderful comrade. On September 15th, it was again a grey, gloomy day, ten-point cloudiness at an altitude of no more than 400 to 500 metres. Rozhkov and I flew to cover our troops in the area of Zhukovka station. Barely passed over the ground positions of our troops, as we noticed the Mi-110 coming from our side at a glancing flight. Rozhkov, see? I'm transmitting on the radio. Yes, I see it. Let's go. Roger. We let the enemy pass a little ahead, and on a cross-country course came in his tail. From the first attack, the Nazi air pirate was shot down, but Rozhkov immediately transmits on the radio. At an altitude of 500, I see six Mi-109 and two Mi-110. Fourfold numerical superiority of the enemy. What to do? Instantly we make a decision. We switch to shaving flight, increase speed, and then vigorously gain altitude, keeping the enemy planes in sight. Passing near the clouds, we descend, increase speed and attack the enemy from behind. Nazi pilots did not expect such audacity. They had just started to rearrange themselves to attack us, and suddenly two MiGs preempted them. For a moment, the enemy was in confusion. It was quite enough for Roshkov to destroy one Mi-109 with a marking cue. At me in the sight clearly loomed silhouette Mi-110. Aiming at the gunner, I pressed the throttles, but the machine guns were silent. The tape broke. I whirled past the fascist plane. But the Hitler obviously realised that I did not open fire by chance and rushed after me. He was followed by three more Mi-109 and one Mi-110 and two Mi-109 Chasid Roskov. From hunters we turn it into game, and I was in a particularly unenviable position. Roskov knew that my MiG failed armament but could not help me. He only had time to dodge the fire messes, and yet Roskov persistently tried to get through to me and cover me with the fire of his machine guns. However, it was not possible. Now my salvation depended only on Roskov. Try to go into the clouds, understand? I told him over the radio. I'm already in the clouds, he replied. I break away from enemy planes and also go into the clouds, leading the plane by instruments breaking through the clouds upwards. At a height of about 1,500 metres, I see that two Mi-109 also behind the clouds. I again go into the clouds, taking a course towards the airfield. I ask Rozhkov, he says that everything is all right. He is going home in the clouds. So we came out of an unequal fight. And at the airfield, my friends were worried. After all, we reported on the radio that we met with eight Messerschmitts. And then it was no time to talk. 
and when Roshkov and I, in 25-30 minutes on wounded airplanes, sat down on their airfield, battle friends picked us up in their arms. Alive, damn it! Sasha Onishchenko clapped me on the shoulder. Did you have any doubts, Sasha? We'll fight again. Berezhnoi, Shkatov, Sibirin, Vanin, Fedorov, Kalamurzin surrounded us in a tight ring. Major Trilevich, the squadron commander, came up. How did you and the eight met? Tell me. Tell me. It is impossible to depict in words the air battle, that colossal tension of all moral and physical forces which covers the pilot in battle. Memory holds only the most important thing. To come out of the unequal battle, to save the fighting machines cost us huge efforts, and to tell as if there was nothing to tell. Roshkov's airplane is literally riddled, punctures in the planes and fuselage. Looking at his machine, even our, seen kinds of technician Vanin shook his head, how much to work here? And the pilots were frankly surprised. How did Roshkov manage to reach the airfield? That's how we flew. That's how we fought the enemy. The pilot's workload was pushed to the limit. In those days, we only dreamed, at the slightest opportunity to take a nap. After all, the whole day, intense combat work, and as soon as dusk fell, we fell on the bunks. But life on the airfield with the onset of darkness did not stop. Technicians, mechanics, motorists, who served the flights all day, at night treated wounds received by fighters, prepared airplanes for new battles. In order that fascist night bombers could not notice the lights on the airfield, aviation specialists arranged over the airplanes something like tents. And in the morning, just before daylight, when pilots received combat missions, all the planes were already ready and our faithful friends aviation specialists again saw us off to battle. And when did they only rest? At any time on the airfield you could see military technicians Vanin, Soyatkolov, Korolev, Volchenkov, Voitov. These people, with their selfless labour, made an invaluable contribution to the success of air fighters. And if we were always ready to take to the air, the merit in this primarily belonged to them, your reliable combat friends. Every day the pilots of the regiment were looking for a meeting with the enemy. On the Bryansk front, the Nazis did not have very many airplanes. We suffered losses mainly from bombing raids and assaults on our airfields by Messerschmitts. Such losses are very frustrating, because they are largely avoidable. At our airfield, despite repeated raids by enemy planes, not a single fighter aircraft was not out of action, only because all aircraft were dispersed and well camouflaged. At the airfield, where the squadron stood Captain Ovcharov, in the first raid, Messers set fire to six MiG. This disaster occurred only because of neglect of elementary camouflage, in war, for mistakes have to pay in full. It is impossible to correct or, as we often said, eliminate the noted shortcomings in 99 cases out of 100. And it is necessary to realise this in peacetime, otherwise it will be too late. Ovcharov neglected this requirement, and here is the result. A lot of trouble caused us and anti-aircraft artillery of the enemy. All Hitlerite airfields had a good air defence, especially strongly covered the base airfields. Even on August 30th, when our ground troops began preparations for a counter-attack, it was very important to know whether the Nazis are not planting reinforcements for their aviation. Lieutenant Voinov and his wingman, Junior. Lieutenant Verkozin continuously flew reconnaissance and watched the airfields of the enemy's air force. It became known to us that the base airfield of Hitlerites is located not far from Seshcha. That's why the reconnaissance here was especially careful. Igor Voinov had been over this airfield many times. He had time to study and the system of its air defence and ways of the best approach to it. Every time he deceived the Nazis, he suddenly appeared above them and just as instantly left, having had time to see everything and remember everything. We used to say that if Voenov flies for reconnaissance, the necessary data will be extracted. And Igor himself gradually believed in his invulnerability. Together with Verkozin, he once again flew to the area of Seshcha. 
Already on the approach to the airfield, our scouts were met by strong anti-aircraft machine gun fire. The pilots realised that the enemy had significantly increased the number of anti-aircraft machine guns to cover the airfield. There were new firing points where there were none yesterday. Anti-aircraft guns on the left, Verkozin told Voinov. I see, replied Igor. The scouts increased speed and at extremely low altitude took a course to the airfield. This manoeuvre in principle was perfectly correct, as the enemy anti-aircraft gunnery calculations in these cases was difficult to aim fire. But when the pilots flew over the airfield, the enemy began firing from all firing points, and there were a lot of them. Verkozin saw Voinov turn to the side where the fire seemed weaker to him. This decision turned out to be fatal. It was from this side of the enemy opened hurricane fire on our planes. Voinov and Verkozin threw their fighters from side to side. The smoke of explosions now and then hid them from each other. But seconds passed, and grey-winged fighters again continued their rapid flight. For a moment, Verkozin lost Voinov from his sight. When he came out from under the hurricane fire, he saw how his comrade's plane in the flames soared upwards and then crashed into the ground. So a wonderful commander, pilot Igor Voinov, died in front of Verkozin's eyes. A wonderful warrior, a charming man left us. Intelligence data, reported by Verkozin, said that the airfield near Seshcha concentrated about a hundred enemy bombers. Our aviation launched a bombing attack on it. The enemy immediately lost 15 airplanes. However, the situation both on the ground and in the air every day became more tense. The German fascist command was concentrating forces for a new offensive, and it was felt in everything. More enemy planes appeared in the air, and their pilots began to act more boldly and brazenly. The soul of our regiment was pilot Sasha Onishchenko. He was selflessly faithful to the army comradeship, gave all himself to flying. Our friendship lasted more than a year, but in my memory he will remain forever. A quarter of a century has passed, but often in the hours of rest I close my eyes, and the image of a young pilot warrior stands before me. Small stature, dense, always with a smile. If we had to look for Onishchenko, we went to the place where the laughter was heard. It was the most accurate guide. Sasha loved a joke, a funny tease, but he joked with such a good humour, with such a sense of tact, that even if someone played a joke, comrades never took offence at him. Just like Igor Voinov, Sasha loved children very much. Until the beginning of the war, he spent all his free time among children. It's time for you to get married, Sasha, and get your own, Marina told him more than once, and he joked back. We're going according to plan. This event is scheduled for 1941. I cannot before. You need to prepare everything. Onishchenko was appointed to the 162nd Fighter Aviation Regiment as a commander of the Link and he spared no effort to train young pilots, persistently, patiently, taught them the art of aerobatics and air combat, honed the technique of piloting. His pets, Verkhozin and Volintsevich, studied diligently, and when the Great Patriotic War began, they together with him skillfully crushed the enemy. At the front, Onishchenko fell to the share of one of the most difficult and responsible tasks, to ensure the actions of attack aviation and the pilots of Major Lozhechnikov's regiment thanked him for clear and skilful cover. The day is running out, and the data received by the reconnaissances show that at the airfield near Roslavl land, U-87 and U-88. The regiment commander Major Resnik decided to strike the enemy airfield with three units. Onishchenko was ordered to lead the group. He has repeatedly masterfully performed such tasks. The group included Shkatov, Volintsevich, Verkhozin, Berezhnoy, Potapenko, Roshkov, Babi, Seroglazov. Our fighters went to the enemy airfield suddenly. Enemy planes were refueling. As soon as Onishchenko's group appeared, two messers started their engines and tried to take off, but were set on fire by accurate bursts of Berezhny and Roshkov. Anti aircraft artillery opened fire but a group of suppression of enemy fire consisting of Verkozin, 
Volintsevich, Seroglazov and Babia dropped bombs on anti-aircraft guns and then fired on them from machine guns. The set on fire, Junkers and refueling tankers were burning. At the airfield, panic began, but the surviving means of air defence continued to resist. Sasha Onishchenko's plane was hit by an anti-aircraft shell. He immediately transmitted on the radio, took a course of 90 kada and descended towards the front. Dima Berishnoy ordered Volintsevich's pair to cover Onishchenko. The rest of the planes made another approach to attack the enemy planes and then caught up with Onishchenko and the accompanying pair of Volintsevich. 09, how are you? requested on the radio Berezhnoi. Sasha reported that so far, normal, the plane is controlled. And how do you feel? Nothing, I'll fly. But everyone could see that Onishchenko's plane is flying down. All Sasha's thoughts were focused on how to save the war machine. Time drags very slowly in such cases. But finally down below, clearly visible flashes of gunfire. The ground is cut in deep wrinkles by trenches, communication lines. This is the front line. Now we fly over our troops and in case of what we can use a parachute or land in the field. But the pilots noticed that Onishchenko's plane began to lurch from wing to wing. Apparently something happened to the control. Berezhnoi suggested, if there is no possibility to continue the flight, to jump with a parachute while the height still allows, or to make a landing in the field. IIR-09, as long as the airplane is controllable, perhaps I will reach the airfield. However, it was increasingly difficult to control the airplane. Falling speed, losing altitude. Here Berezhnoi could not stand it and transmitted, Sasha, jump! Otherwise it will be too late. In response, the voice of Onishchenko, You cannot abandon the car. I'll make a landing from the get-go. Pilots did not take their eyes off the plane Onishchenko and here is the airfield. And suddenly they saw that the airplane sharply went down and crashed into the ground. So the heart of a wonderful pilot and battle friend stopped beating. In the last flight against the enemy airfield, the group headed by Sasha Onishchenko inflicted tangible damage to the enemy. Eight, enemy planes and four gasoline refuelers were destroyed. Sasha himself destroyed two Ju 88s. On the same day, of Charov's group stormed a column of enemy vehicles. Three staff buses were seen in the column. Our pilots destroyed them. Division Commander General Klevtsov announced gratitude to all participants of the assault. But even combat success and encouragement of the general did not improve the mood of the pilots. At the airfield was not heard jokes, no one laughed. We had already gotten used to the constant game with death, but Sasha's death shocked everyone. We understood. War is war. Everything can happen in battle. And yet my heart and mind refused to believe that Sasha was gone, that he would never again sound his Ukrainian singing voice, his cheerful laughter would not ring out, he would not lift his combat airplane into the air. After all, just this morning I told him that I had received a letter from Marina, in which she wrote how she lives and gave everyone a big hello and wishes for success in the battles. When he read the part where Marina asked to help each other in battle, he said, These are noble words. And just two days ago, flying out to intercept an air enemy, he and I shot down a bomber, Junkers 88. And now my battle friend is gone. He gave his very young life for his native people, for the carefree laughter of children, for the happiness of millions. In the evening, Major Resnik gathered all the pilots. Onishchenko died as a hero. The desire to save the plane deserves the warmest approval. But damn it, the regimental commander even banged his fist on the table. Onishchenko could live and continue to fight the Germans. The major fell silent. After a little silence added, about parachutes do not forget, and for Sasha we will avenge. And when the next day, September 24th, we received a combat mission, everyone said to himself, Today we'll begin the reckoning for Sasha's death.